Hello, everybody, again. Um, humor. Am I going to make you laugh? Probably make you laugh already. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is one of the most complicated classes. I'm going to try to keep it uh, kind of compact uh, because, you know, humor requires rhythm. That's, that's just how it is. And we've been taught that art somehow has to be deep and serious and it has to elevate us to a place of, you know... Uh, beauty and maybe not maybe the option here is to make people laugh how about that is there enough laughter in your life is it ever enough anyway um i thought it'd be nice for us to start with a song i'm just gonna play the song uh by singer songwriter john grant um you know he has uh he knows his way around tunes and he knows his way around humor in lyrics, which I think is one of the hardest things to pull next to art. You know, you can be a comedian and that's your job. And, you know, there is a paved way of tried and tested techniques you can employ in order to make people laugh. But when you make art, whether it's music or visual arts or any other format, that's meant to trigger that kind of feeling of cracking up. There is very little you can borrow from an other artist that you can guarantee will work with you. You know how humor, it's very idiosyncratic, right? Humor is yours. And there are ways in which you imperceptibly communicate something that will make people laugh. So it always is this kind of crafty uh, dimension to explore. And it's very, very yours. It's very difficult that somebody will be able to appropriate it outright and run with it. On the note, here comes John Grant. I wanted to change the world, but I could not even change my underwear. And when the shit got really, really out of hand. Keeps receding like my self-confidence As if I ever had any of that stuff anyway I hope I didn't destroy your celebration Or your bad mitzvah birthday party or your Christmas You put me in this cage and threw away the key It was this us and them shit that did me in Tell me that my life is based upon a lie I casually mention that I pissed in your coffee I hope you know that all I want from you is sex To be with someone who looks smashing in athletic wear And if your haircut isn't right, you'll be dismissed You'll get your walking papers and you can leave now I don't know what to want from this world I really don't know what to want from this world And I don't know what it is you want to want from me You really have no right to want anything from me at all Why don't you take it out on somebody else? Why don't you bore the shit out of somebody I 
don't know what to want from this world I really don't know what to want from this world and I don't know what it is you want to want from me You really have no right to want anything from me at all Why don't you take it out on somebody else? Why don't you bore the shit out of somebody else? Why don't you tell somebody else that they're selfish? A weakling coward who put that in So Jesus isn't coming here to pick you up You'll still be sitting right here ten years from now You're just a sucker, but we'll see who gets the last laugh Who knows, maybe you'll get to be the next queen of Okay, I hope you enjoy that beautiful song called Queen of Denmark. I recommend all albums uh, by John Grant, um, especially in the album dimension with different instrumentation. He's great at the piano, I saw, but like, you know, with a full kind of instrumentation, some orchestral elements. He really um, is amazing and very witty, very witty lyrics. On that note, from one John to another, we're going into John Cage. Uh, now, I really care that uh, you get the handle uh, with, with John Cage because like Duchamp, he's another character who really changed the history of uh, art with a piece that asks an important and clear question. What is music? You remember that the bottom line question with Duchamp's ready-made is what is art? If an everyday object I purchase at the shop can become art once I remove its function, then what is this thing we call music, right? What are the universal pre prerequisites that something we call music has to embody? So John Cage staged something absolutely revolutionary in 1952 called 4 minutes and 33 seconds. Uh, the aficionados call it 4.33. And we're going to experience it together right now. And now a performance of John Cage's 4.33. Please welcome our soloist, William Marx.
okay. How did it feel, right? Can you imagine the revolutionary proposal? 433 needs to be played in a theater. There needs to be a setting that it's associated with uh, classical music, especially, and needs to be inserted in the program after the ears of the um, uh, crowd that has uh, attuned itself to um, the, the you know range of instruments that are played by a classical uh, orchestra, and then this silence, right? This four minutes and 33 seconds of something that happens, but that it's not necessarily nothing. There's something really fascinating about this proposal and the difficulty we encounter with a soundscape that it's not structured according to the rhythmics of what we call music. So what is it? Uh, it's not just this negative space. It's one of the things I do if I were you, like people, when they don't know what to say in the arts, they bring about this negative space notion. There's no negative space, right? Space is space and everything is interlaced. So there are different bodies occupying different spaces and nothing is empty. This idea of the like negative space, it's like one of the biggest bowling I've ever heard in my life. So likewise, sound and silence are not this dichotomy. Silence doesn't really exist. You probably noticed that there were sounds uh, infiltrating the performance. The space, the, what the performance does, 433 is creating a box, right? It's a frame into which sounds happen, whether it's the coughing of the audience, somebody dropping the keys, you at home uh, <clears throat> uh, placing your mug on the table. That was the composition, right? So this is what John Cage had to say about the reaction, which, as you can imagine, wasn't particularly flattering after the first performance of 433. He said, they missed the point. There's no such thing as silence. What they thought was silence, because they didn't know how to listen, was full of accidental sounds. You could hear the wind stirring outside during the first movement. During the second, raindrops began pattering the roof. And during the third, the people themselves made all kinds of interesting sounds as they talked or walked out. What does it tell us about attention? How did you do with four minutes and 33 seconds of what seemed initially nothing, but that was actually filled with all these other things going on that we haven't been trained to listen to? And <clears throat> what does 433 accomplish? The choice of a prestigious venue and the social status of the composer and the performers automatically heightens audiences' expectations for the piece. According to Cage, duration is the essential building block of all music. And I can tell you that he chose 4, 433 specifically based on a brand of 7-inch records uh, that used to be made at that time in the 50s um, by a record company called Muzak. Uh, and they basically made elevator music. So those seven inches were the soundtrack to elevators and 433 was pretty much the standard time of them. And the third point is that the work of music is defined not only by its content, but also by the behavior it elicits from the audience. And now that you're ruminating on all that, I want to look at Eve Klein and one of the most fascinating artists of the 50s uh, and 60s really challenged the history of representation with his humor. Not an easy thing to do. You can wonder whether um, <clears throat> John Cage wanted to be humorous. His reaction to um, the response people had at the first performance seemed far from uh, accepting, but it is a joke in a sense. So that's what people thought. Said, this must be a joke, right? Not many people were laughing, but you can see the love right now. You know, now 433 has become this cuddly artwork that the connoisseur of conceptual art cherishes to the grave. So uh, the same with Yves Klein. You know, some of his works are jokes outright. Some of it, however, it's very serious. I think that's the interesting part of humor and works of art that try to attract our attention 
through laughter, through humor, through a, a humorous realization. There's always something serious about them. There's always something deep. There's always something to get to in the end. It's never slapstick comedy. It's never just a joke in itself. So we're going to talk about the IKB Blue in a minute. But before that, I wanted to show you this picture to show you how Yves Klein really knew a thing or two when it came to humor. Now, this is actually a photograph uh, that's been uh, manipulated in order to remove a mattress that was placed on the street so that he could just land onto it. And it was published in 1960 on uh, a fictitious um, newspaper that he just published. He put himself on the front paper with a title related to the uh, leap into the void, the artist that took to space and uh, distributed it to news agents around Paris. So people started to buy this newspaper uh, that was uh, totally fictitious. I mean, tell me that that isn't a great joke. And also at the time, you know, don't forget it's the 1960s, uh, people just wondered what is going on with this image. And you think the imagination that went on here, using himself as this um, metaphor of creativity and how the artist has a duty to leap into the air and the possibility as well as an individual to leap into the air in search of creativity. And this is what an Eve Klein IKB painting looks like. He actually um, made the color himself uh, and it's a variant of other existing uh, blue hues that were already available on the market. He copyrighted it. That's, you know, another joke, another kind of uh, opportunity to make us think about uh, something quite serious uh, like who owns colors, right? Um, but again, with a kind of humorous way, in a kind of humorous dimension. And uh, blue has a very in interesting and important history in, in art. So um, it has a spiritual uh, background. It is the color used for the cloak of the Madonna in pretty much all Renaissance paintings because it was the most expensive color to make. You see that religious and financial circle that always uh, bubbles up at some point, um, whether it's gold or blue. And actually blue was more expensive than uh, gold because it came from Afghanistan. You know, we called it uh, ultramarine blue and people think it's called ultramarine because it's like bluer than the sea or something like that. But it's because from Italy, you had to go beyond the sea in order to get it, right? Afghanistan. And it was a terrible, terrible journey to get there. Not only travel through the southern part of the Italian peninsula, which is very rocky, very forbidding, and then the sea, and then uh, the stone, lapis lazuli, from which the ultramarine blue came from, was up in the mountains in Afghanistan. It wasn't on the beach waiting for the uh, traders who worked with art pigments. Uh, to collect it from the beach. So it was a task. You'd have to go up into the mountains in Afghanistan and find these boulders which had to be cracked open by setting uh, a light of fire right underneath them and then pouring icy water on top of them to crack them open, find the lapis lazuli, crack it into manageable uh, stones and bring it back down to the beach then cross the sea again and to Italy. That's what made it super expensive. So Blue and transcendence, it's the color of the sky, it's the color of the sea. Entities that are impossible to objectify, obtain and capture. That's why the Madonna is also associated with the color blue. So you can see again the joke and the serious, right? It's copyrighted but it's also a joke, also transcendent and spiritual. And we also know again that Yves Klein connected his research on monochromes uh, to the um, suprematist uh, experimentations of Kazmi Malevich and this notion of paintings not as representational planes from which we gain narrative and stories, but as portals to spiritual dimensions. So, <clears throat> also don't forget, at the beginning of the 1960s, monochromes were seen as a joke. Uh, in themselves by most of the general public, even today, uh, I think the majority of the general public probably laugh at a gallery 
that uh, has on show only monochrome paintings. But th at the bottom of it, the monochrome painting states something quite interesting, that color is the essential signifier of all art, and that color is capable of communicating meaning that does not require any other human manipulation beyond revelation. So that's what uh, Yves Klein did. However, uh, again, the dimension of the joke. So in this exhibition called Propositions, which took place in Milan in 1957, uh, Yves Klein exhibited the same uh, motif, which is his blue um, paintings, of exactly the same size, a number of them priced differently. Can you imagine? What a joke. You walk into the gallery space, you think, oh, I fancy myself one of these blue uh, Yves Klein paintings that are so fashionable right now among the cutting edge collectors. And then you speak to the person at the desk and they give you a price list where you can clearly see that all the paintings look the same, but they're all pitched at different prices. So it does really mess with this notion of value. What is artistic value? How is the financial value of a work of art related to uh, its attributed or essential quality, and ultimately, uh, which one should you buy? So if you're a collector and you walk into that gallery space, um, did you want the cheapest one? Because it's most likely going to be your best investment. Or do you want the most expensive one? Because ultimately, um, the cheaper one might be worse. That's the psychology, the capitalist psychology that we usually carry with us when you know somebody who doesn't really have the income wants to go to, to um, uh, Whole Foods to do their shopping just because they really feel that there is some added value to some of the products that you can actually find at Dollar Tree and do just the same as uh, the Whole Foods comparison. So interesting um, joke, interesting way to humor an audience of collectors, but also to produce art that you care about. Now, I have to tell you, um, I discovered Yves Klein bit by bit. You know, he's a staple in, uh, in the history of Western art. So you, as a, an art history student, you become aware of him very early on. It was no surprise. But one of the things I, I only discovered a few years ago that was very touching was that the poor man died of two heart attacks. Uh, one a few years apart from each other. Sorry, one a few years apart from the other. And um, apparently both heart attacks was caused by the ridicule that he had to face in his life for being the kind of conceptual artist he wanted to be. He got so upset one time when a film director included a joke about his work uh, totally chippening what he was doing in his film that he had a heart attack. And then another one, still based on another big upset he received from uh, critic reviews. Um, there's uh, uh, an interview with the wife of Yves Klein who says that when he had the second uh, heart attack, um, she knew something was seriously wrong when he started to turn blue, which I also thought, it's like, wow, you know, somebody's got humor and poetry uh, intertwined to perfection in that family. It's, it just seemed such a statement to make and she she explained in an interview how it seemed uh she knew he was gone at that point uh and that he seemed somehow uh perfectly plausible that he would turn his body would turn blue at that point and reconnect with the real principle of his art however the purpose of this class is to make you laugh not cry so here we are with another fantastic artist who really left a mark in the 1950s and early 60s conceptual panorama. That is Piero Manzoni. If you haven't met Piero's art, you really haven't lived yet, let me tell you. When it comes to humor, the man is the king. So unfortunately, he died very young at the age of 30, 1963. Another heart attack. Um, and a very similar uh, artists to Yves Klein, they always go in, and hand in hand in terms of legacy and influence. And we see Piero here smiling in his studio. For this work specifically, I'm about to talk to you in a second, the toilet. Haha, <laughs> we're getting 
into some strange territory here. But before we get to the toilet, I wanted to give you a sense of how uh, Manzoni used humor in his art. I was imprinted by Pierre Manzoni's art when I was 14, uh, and we were taken to the Castello di Rivoli Museum in Turin from Milan. It was a day trip. And I really, I cannot tell you, when, despite the fact that I studied art in Italy, our teachers took us to museums like once a year, which is criminal. Like Milan has some, has some great museums that were there. It was just like, you know, um, the laziness of public education underfunded and all that stuff, I guess. Uh, but one time uh, we ended up in Turin, day trip. And what was there? Piero Manzoni. We just weren't ready for Piero Manzoni. We had been brainwashed with Michelangelo, Titian, Raphael and whatever. We had no idea what contemporary art really was. Boom, we are presented with the cylinders claiming that inside there's a line that's 33 meters long. You can see how that subverts any conception of uh, classical art. How is this meant to be art, we kept wondering. But it really, I think, opened the window in my mind that then has been just like wide open since. So why not um, dumping students at the deep end and let them sink or swim? Uh, my mind started to wonder what is inside this, you know, it's like, is the line like a thread? Is the line like a rope? Or is it like drawn onto something? Is it made of metal? You know, like you start wondering and what Piero Manzoni really does is foregrounding the fact that art, all art, is based on a system of beliefs that we most often believe that the work of an artist is of value just because an art collector uh, puts millions of money into that work and because they do so after a gallerist or a curator tells them this is where you should put your money. Um, the success, the value, financial or cultural of a work of art is always defined by the shared acknowledgement, the shared social, cultural acknowledgement that there is value in the work. One person believing there's value in your work is not enough. You need to band an army of people who keep saying there's value here, there's value here. And guess what? Bit by bit by bit, if you're lucky, it'll just start snowballing into truth and nobody will stop you. That's pretty much how some of the most questionable contemporary artists and modern artists have made their careers, just by being able to trigger that uh, effect. And here it is, I've ruined the uh, enigma for you. There is a piece of paper inside the cylinder um, with a line drawn upon, but think about this. Technically, you shouldn't be opening the cylinder. Some of the cylinders have been opened by collectors who really couldn't hold their hands still anymore and were tortured by the dilemma of have I bought what I was promised by the tin or there's nothing inside it. The terrible, terrible anxiety induced by the vacuum, the void, death. And then this. Piero Manzoni turned the art world upside down quite literally by tinning his own feces in what's called merda d'artista, or artist poo. Now, this is apparently coming out uh, as a joke response to his father, who would always say, I think your work is shit. And uh, there it is. Uh, tins allegedly filled with the artist's excrement. I could run a two hours class on this. It's so fascinating. First of all, Let's try to just summarize the joke. Well, th who's the joke on? The joke is on the collectors, right? Uh, art has trained us to appreciate and value durable and precious materials. Here, collectors scramble to grab for themselves a tin filled with poo. Mm, the game has changed. Imagine the gallery representing Piero Manzoni in 1961 contacting collectors to say, on this day, we are going to release this number of cans, limited editions, never again. Wait for the best part of the joke at the price 
of gold set for that very day by the market. So look what Piero Manzoni is accomplishing here. He is aligning for the first time in the history of the world excrements, human excrements, and gold, right? The worthless and the most valuable. And by tinning it, triggers our system of beliefs, our curiosity, and our attention to look at excrements or consider the idea of excrements like we never have before. Excrements that never entered the history of art book before. See how we monopolized our attention through a capitalist consumerist device, the tin. It doesn't allow us to see what's inside. We have to trust that what's inside is what's promised on the outside. Again, this is a very smart, witty um, critique of the art world. We have to trust our curators. We have to trust our critics. Otherwise, even a Picasso, at the end of the day, is a canvas worth 30 bucks and some oil paint smeared on it worth 5 bucks, right? So where is this value ballooning from? Value can be inscribed to it to the point that it transcends the value system, economic system, that uh, rules the rest of the isn't it fascinating that this, this value is just emerging from the systems of belief itself? So, of course, if you were to purchase one of these beautiful tins, which I certainly recommend, um, wouldn't you be scratching your head at night sometimes? It'd be impossible to sleep and think, oh, wow, I wonder if there is poo in there. How much, how, how have you ever desired poo in your life like this? Never, right? Isn't that fascinating? Piero Manzoni really uh, accomplished something with this work. And this is the funniest part. Because Manzoni sold each can by weight at gold's daily market price, the shit literally became worth its weight in gold. In retrospect, this has proved to be a bargain. At $35.20, the equivalent of 18 pounds roughly per ounce, the price at which the London Gold Pool uh, wanted to fix the precious metal, a tin originally would have cost about $37. That was 1961. 30 years later, Sotheby's auctioned one for $67,000. Then the price of gold had climbed to uh, 374 per ounce. If Manzoni's initial pricing scheme still held, it should have cost only $395.77. In other words, in 1991, Merida d'Artista had outperformed gold in price by more than 70 times. Then incredible. That is the joke that keeps on giving. Even years and years and years after the artist is dead, the joke only gets better. And of course, um, the work has become even more loved by collectors and art historians in general, until Bernard Bazil decided to appropriate one of the tins by purchasing it and turning it into his own work, which would be a critique of Manzoni in this case, so opening it to reveal what's inside. And what do you think he found? This, a conglomeration of plaster and cotton wool, no pool in sight. However, the estimated value of the work by Basil is £5,000 to £6,000. Bear in mind, this is a real Piero Manzoni tin that has been opened by the artist. That's the intervention of the artist was to open it and turn it into his own work. It's fascinating that at that point, the price plummets because it no longer is a real Piero Manzoni. And what does he tell us about the other tins? There's 90 of them. One sold at Sotheby's in 2007 for 105 pounds. Are the others also filled with plaster? Well, Manzoni's assistant said, if you think they're all filled with plaster, you are underestimating the genius of Piero Manzoni. May he have really inserted his feces into at least a few of these tins. And just that notion gets the collectors so uh, charged up and so excited about this piece. But what I really love about it, it's the 
critique, you know, getting collectors and museums to buy pool and just laughing all the way to the bank uh, while revealing how we invest value into all art objects at the same time. And of course, Piero Manzoni's uh, humor is also visible in this work called Fiato d'Artista. Fiato d'Artista means artist's breath. This is a balloon of the kind you buy any, at any shop. It's made of that rubbery material that a few uh, days after the balloon has been inflated begins to uh, release the air bit by bit until there's nothing left and this is what the artwork looks like now. The plastic, the, the rubbery material is actually melted onto the uh, pedestal. So the question really is, what are you buying as a collector? Do you see the anti-capitalist challenge here? Uh, the question of what is the work of art after it decays? And in that sense, where is the joke? Think about this notion of the artist's breath, so pompous and obnoxious. The notion that the artist breathes life into the sculpture, right? There it is, and collector buys it. And of course, another amazing artist, feminist artist who used humor in order to make a case for feminism, Vali export. In the 1960s, Vali said, our attempts to cultivate a direct and uncontrolled language in art were based upon the idea that the dominant language was a form of manipulation. Now, Vali export um, gave herself this art name uh, to brand herself. This is a critique of uh, capitalism again. When she changed her name in 1967 to Valley Export, the Austrian ast ast artist Waltrud Hollinger uh, renounced the names of her father and her former husband, tokens of patriarchal ownership, and transformed herself into a brand identity. Almost immediately after this break, Export then 27 began to develop a body of the most important experimental feminist art of the post-war period, exploring the nexus of relationships among politics, experience, and personality. Her humor, it's kind of aggressive, you know, when it comes to um, humor itself. But this is one of my favorite pieces, uh, the uh, Action Pants Genital Panic. This, these are the posters that were actually uh, remain, that remain from uh, the performance itself. So provocation would characterize a further performances, specifically action pants, genital panic. I mean, isn't that a fantastic title? I mean, what more do you want? For which the Lee export uh, is best known. For this performance, the artist walked into an experimental art film house in Munich wearing crotchless trousers, let me show you again. You can see there now in the picture, right? That's not some sort of um, panty put on over the, the jeans. That's the crutch that's being cut out. Uh, for this performance, the artist walked into an experimental art film house in Munich wearing crutchless trousers and a tight leather jacket with her hair teased wildly. She roamed through the rows of seated spectators who exposed genitalia level with their faces, challenging the public to engage with a real woman Instead of with images on a screen, she illustrated her notion of expanded cinema in which the artist's body activates the live context of watching. And here is her conception of expanded cinema. Now, how does this work? You can see Vali export there with this structure around her breasts. It's in the shape of a theater. It has two, uh, it has curtains at the front, so like a little mini portable stage. And in this action, she invited men to insert their hands into the theater stage uh, and fondle her breasts for a certain period of time she was in charge of. So she'd have a stopwatch and define the time uh, which uh, these men were allowed to uh, touch her. Here is a clip of a screen at an exhibition showing you this very piece. Oh!
you know, this is a piece, um, it's very humorous, uh, and yet also disturbing. It's a piece uh, that usually divides students um, because of obvious reasons. Some argue that this is not a feminist piece at all because she's allowing men to treat her like an object and objectify her. However, uh, others uh, disagree and claim that uh, this is uh, a very interesting feminist maneuver in which the artist is deliberately objectifying herself but retaining control because she's timing the experience and ultimately making these men look like idiots who are just walking up for this uh, titillating experience in front of everybody else. It kind of reveals the debasement, you know, the fact that actually uh, men would partake into this uh, piece and take up the bait is probably the biggest issue that she's interested in revealing. And you can see her there looking right in the eyes at the man who's touching her breasts um, as if, you know, with, with a kind of like sense of, yeah, I know, you're sad. Uh, but there is something also fascinating about the desire to cover up the breasts because in that way she's actually managing the attention of the viewer to her eyes. The idea that you have to make eye contact with me you are not able to touch my breasts. It's really complicated, it's a really provocative piece and I can see why it divides students. From um, Valley Export, one of my heroes, um, Aki Nomata. Now, Aki Nomata is a really uh, cool contemporary artist. Um, she's really uh, focused on the interface of uh, art, science and nature and her work, most often than not, is about empathy. So, you see this beautiful uh, object here that's presented in the gallery as a suspended piece titled, I wear the dog's hair and the dog wears my hair. Mm, that's an intriguing title. This is a dog's coat the artist made herself. It took her quite a, a while, a few years, as you can see here, as this is her hair, layered and layered and layered in order to create this beautiful coat. But that is only half of the work. This beautiful picture of uh, Aki walking the dog in the park comes with the piece itself. But as you can see from the photograph, there's also an item she's wearing and it's this beautifully fashionable coat she's made herself with the hair of her dog. Ha! laughing, gasping. This is also a good work for objection. Uh, beautiful little coat, fashionable, dog's hair. Uh, what's going on here, right? Um, have you ever thought about harvesting the hair of your dog to make a coat? You're probably curling away into your chair in disgust. But after all, what's really different between dog's hair and sheep? Why can't you use like wool? You know, your wool is probably a little bit fancier and like softer than most dog's hair. But look what a fantastic item she could create. And look how she makes us um, aware of the fact that we exclude certain materials that could be recycled just because of our cultural coordinates telling us that is abject. This is uh, something you should be disposing of. Uh, think about hair. We go to the hairdresser or the barber and your hair gets chucked away. I know some people recycle their hair, especially when it's like long and it can be sold to make wigs for uh, people who have lost their hair for different reasons. There are charities that work with that. I certainly uh, think it's a great idea. But the majority of us just lets it go. What could be done with hair? Could we power something that could make the environment better? We don't even go there because all these materials have been classified as abject and therefore end up waste, end up into waste uh, just immediately. And Cindy Sherman, talk about humor. This is of course one of the images that made her famous in the uh, 1970s, the film Still uh, series. You know that she's uh, the subject of her own work always. So this is Cindy Sherman with uh, makeup, hat, uh, dress, trying to evoke the presence of a different feminine character. 
Her career is entirely done of this idea of creating a representation of femininity that usually critiques or upturns the uh, notion of objectification perpetrated by Hollywood films as well as photography in magazines. And I wanted to show you this series that's more recent. You know, she's one of the most successful and prolific photographers of her time, um, where she's clearly humoring uh, a certain typology of a uh, woman. And she does it over and over and over in this series that she made in the early 2000s. You see how she poses. This is always Cindy Sherman herself with makeup, wigs, dresses, lighting. <clears throat> creating caricatures in this sense, but really playing with the borderline of reality, what could be real and what isn't. Uh, Cindy Sherman has come under fire for these photographs because uh, some have claimed she's just making fun of people's bodies and people's cultural inclinations, but uh, others see her humor. You know, this is a matter of humor, and when you uh, humor somebody something, um, Beware, you're going to be misunderstood, right? Somebody is just not going to see the fun part, the fun side of things, and it's going to critique you accordingly. And I wanted to also talk about Wendy Redstar, a fantastic artist, uh, who's a Native American artist, who's actually uh, taken on humor in her work in order to address the notion that Native American artists are expected to be stuck in the past. They are expected to always represent a uh, or perform, if you like, a, a primordial encounter with colonialism and as if they were frozen into that moment of the encounter. That's what the white market and white society understands them as. So these images that she uh, carefully crafts um, really bring this notion of humor, as you can see, through different objects that she gathers herself around, that she, uh, the way she poses, and also artifacts on the wall, kind of uh, instigate a consideration about um, what is it to be Native American today, and how do you feed a certain stereotype that in this case seems to echo the perfection of the housewife of the 50s, but seen as this kind of mishmash uh, of situations, images, and object. And I want to play this clip as well so that you get a better sense of her work, the themes that she approaches, and how uh, humor of a certain kind can apply to work that is indeed very difficult in nature. over a year with Wendy to pull this show together so it's very exciting that it's come together tonight after so long in the planning process. Wendy Redstar, A Scratch on the Earth, is a mid-career retrospective of one of America's rising young artists. Wendy's work explores her identity as a member of the Crow Tribe and she chose the Newark Museum in part because of its collection of both historic and contemporary Native American art. New galleries dedicated to the native artists of North America opened in 2016. That experience in 2016 was a great one for reconnecting with the local um, Lenny Lenape communities. So it kind of really refocused the fact that this literally is Lenape land that the museum is sitting on. And the Lenape Trail runs right through the city of Newark. The catalog for Wendy's exhibit acknowledges this. When I was in grad school, I think it was around the holiday times and I wasn't able to go home and I was really missing home. Without even really consciously thinking about it, I, I knew I could find uh, crow stuff, crow objects, if I went to the Natural History Museum. And now I'm like, wow, that's kind of morbid, right? <laughs> My experience there is what led to the making of the work. And when I walked into the museum, I walked under this giant brontosaurus and all these dinosaur bones. And I, I walked into the native galleries. It's dark in there. I found some crow material. But I also 
had, was witness to everybody like looking at the native objects and realizing, wow, you know, I'm sure the audience, just the way that we've sort of been set up immediately as we walk through the door, assumes that these people don't no longer exist. And there were dioramas, they look like Montana, and I was like, I need to take this back and make this piece that articulates my experience. The Four Seasons photographs launched her career. Ever since, Wendy Redstar has been creating work centered around Native American history and her life, growing up on the Crow Reservation in Montana. So this is uh, my first eagle plume for my first dance. For crows, it's called a wisdom feather, or um, AKA eagle butt feather, because it's located near the tails, the seat of knowledge in the soul of the bird. So. What I've learned is that people don't know about Native people at all. They don't know the history, which isn't just Native history, it's U.S. history. Wendy began to consider how images of Native Americans are used in our culture, such as a photo of Medicine Crow on a bottle of tea. And it made me wonder, like, the people that are using these images, do they know his name? Do they know that he's Crow? Do they know that he's from Montana? Then I started thinking, wait a minute, I don't know what happened that day when he sat down to take that portrait. And so it was that one question and it just led me on this incredible adventure of looking through archives, of going through history. The notes she took became part of a new series using the historic peace delegation photos as a starting point. It wasn't just him. It was a group of six chiefs, and there are portraits of five of the six chiefs that are delegation portraits from 1880. They were going there to meet the president because the U.S. government was trying to put a train through a large chunk of our hunting territory. And like all of these things started coming out of this one project. The more and more that I dug, the more things were revealed the more I knew I didn't know things, and it just kind of kept going. So I do use a, a mix of photography, some of my own photography, some archival photography, and some of my family's photography. Wendy took her own photos for the series, Home is Where My Teepee Sits, showing life on the Crow Reservation today. In the 19th century, its original size was over 38 million acres. Our current reservation has been reduced down to like 2.25 million acres. And so basically, what I'm articulating with this work is what the current reservation looks like. What I know of the Crow Indian Reservation today, because this is where I grew up, and these are sort of the normal things that you would see if you were to drive through my reservation. You'd run into these objects, which are these reservation cars, sort of these broken down cars that have different lives, like they become storage units or a place for me and my cousins to like play in. I love sweat lodges. I find them really fascinating, especially when you're driving around my reservation because they're just out in the landscape. You see these weird dome things and I like that they're very utilitarian, that they're covered and blankets and carpet and uh, anything they can find to keep the heat contained inside for when they use it. Wendy built her own sweat lodge at the Newark Museum. While there are no hot rocks or steam, climbing inside does transport you to another reality. The significance when you go inside for, for the crow is that it's a place to sort of get away from the outside world, to, to pray and think about others and to kind of reconnect with your spiritual side. So when I go back home and you see some of these photos of the broken down res cars or the government houses, one would think, oh, this is like a, a poor community. But for me, I don't see that at all. I just see the cultural richness and vastness of it all. And also considering my ancestors fought so hard for us to keep our, our cultural knowledge.
another artist who uses humor uh, in art uh, quite consistently is Jonathan Jonathan Keats. Jonathan Keats is um, a philosopher by trade who actually makes contemporary art, and in this case, he started to wonder about plants <clears throat> specifically, and plants. Uh, have always been sidelined in the history of representation, as I said earlier in my classes. Uh, they are always in the background, they're always objectified because they're silent and still. So Jonathan Keats started to think about how can we do something to give plants pleasure? How could we subjectify them and recognize that they also have craves, desires, and drives? Well, he decided to create porn for plants because porn is non-functional, right? It's no end, uh, has no end in itself, and therefore it's disinterested from us. We're just producing, providing plants with pleasure, not because we want them to make more fruits so or because we want them to make more flowers, just providing plants with pleasure. So he pr proceeded to film pollinators. Oh, this is like out of this world, but that's humor for you. He pr proceeded to film pollinators um, poll in action, pollinating flowers, and then transferred the film into a, a chromatic range that could be absorbed by plants and proceeded to um, project it on them. So you can see here what the Cinema Botanica, also known as Pornography for Plants, uh, looks like. Very interesting, thought-provoking. Uh, again, it's a work of art that brings us to consider the limits of our conceptions of plants uh, and sexuality and subjectivity, uh, but it's also very, very tongue-in-cheek, very humorous. Thereafter, he worked on photosynthetic restaurant, creating different menus, uh, of course, um, chromatic um, photosynthetic uh, menus for plants. So you can see here plants being fed different uh, colored light from TV screens. And then perhaps this is the strangest consideration he had for plants and this idea that, you know, plants are defined by their fixity. So ultimately allowing plants to travel might probably be uh, something that they would appreciate. And in that case, what would plants be interested in? They wouldn't be interested in monuments. They wouldn't be interested in the sites. But Jonathan Keats thought they might be interested in the sky. So here he projected on them. Um, uh, the skies of Italy, taking therefore metaphorically the plants on a tourist trip. And let's wrap up today's uh, lecture with Ai Weiwei, shall we? Such a beautiful ending. The study of perspective series, which I am very fond of. Um, it is super fascinating because uh, it just, um, you know, it's uh, so slapstick in this way. I, I just said earlier that slapstick is not uh, what works in art, but actually um, there's something here that links the deep question to the slapstick element so quickly and so effectively that he managed to pull it off. You know how artists traditionally, when they learn classical drawing, use a pencil in order to measure proportions and then transpose these on paper. Well, that's exactly what he's doing with his finger, but he's clearly measuring uh, the bullshit of this world through a very, very simple gesture, and he does it to many different icons, as we see here in this series. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and good news is that there's another one coming up soon. Hope you laugh and laughed and laughed.